Well, thank you all for um, the opportunity to be with you today. I want to um, affirm Mike Maddox. Uh, for those of you who were in the 815 service, uh, Mike really has a beautiful reading voice. And he knows how to he knows how to place emphasis on certain words at certain times. And Mike, it's one of the gifts you have, and thank you for sharing it with us. Also, Amen. I went to an occasion this week that uh, Belmont University had to honor Harold Fogelberg, and uh, Harold is retiring at Belmont, and they had a wonderful reception and. I'm so glad Paula was there to hear all the nice things they said about him. <laughs> but it was really a, really a very affirming uh, occasion and you could tell how much people appreciated his teaching uh, at the university. So many gifted people in this class and in this church and so many people share those gifts in so many wonderful ways. Let us pray. Be with us as we study your word. May it feed our hearts and minds, even as we feed others with your presence. Amen. Symbols represent an object that represents something else. Sometimes symbols represent something that is invisible. I was thinking about this lesson the other day and I said to Janine, I said, share with me some of the symbols that uh, we have in our apartment. Well, she started sharing symbols in our bedroom and we never moved beyond the bedroom. She said that ring holder. She said that ring holder over there. She said we bought that in Ireland at the Waterford factory. Well, if you just came in our bedroom and saw the ring holder, it would not mean anything to you, but for us it was symbolic. She said that music box over there was given to us by my brother. And she said that cross stitch on the wall over there was knitted for us by Mary Ann Haney. And it's right there so we can see it. There were two books in there that belonged to her father because her father Leonard was a great reader. And so the books for us were symbolic. For you, they might have just been two books on the shelf. There's a pocket watch that uh, <clears throat> hangs in, in uh, the uh, bedroom. It belonged to her grandfather. Symbols have to be interpreted if they have meaning. For some people, a cross might just be two pieces of wood nailed together. The cross has to be interpreted if it has meaning. The same with uh, the bread and the wine that we receive at Holy Communion. The bread represents the body of Christ. And whenever we partake of it, we're feeding on Christ. We're feeding on his teachings. We're feeding on his presence. It's not just a piece of bread that's torn off and put in our hands, but it's been consecrated. The wine represents the blood of Christ, a symbol of our forgiveness, that we can be forgiven because Jesus shed his blood for us. Well, I think there are probably people who come for the Eucharist who don't know the symbol. Well, it's possible even to participate in something like the Eucharist and not know what the bread and the wine symbolize. We have these um, two hands out in the front of the sanctuary 
and um, there are many interpretations of what those two hands symbolize. Just quickly, what do they symbolize to you? God reaching down. You say God's hand reaching down, our hands reaching up. Yeah. I think that's uh, that's the meaning behind that symbol. But if you didn't understand the symbol, it would just be two hands out the front of the sanctuary. United Methodists have uh, had the cross and flame as our symbol. The cross representing sacrificial love, flame representing the Holy Spirit. So that for us, there's both sacrificial love and also the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now there's a sign, uh, there's a symbol that I don't understand, maybe you do, on our church bus. <coughs> We used to have the cross and flame, and now we have another symbol on the back door of the church bus that I don't know what it is. It won't be, it will not mean anything to me until it's interpreted for me. Now once it's interpreted for me, I will understand what it means. And that's one of the things about symbols they have to be interpreted before we can understand them one of the reasons that revelation is so difficult to understand is because john writes in symbolism and he does not unpack the meaning of his symbolic language when we re when we read revelation we have to unpack that symbolic language for ourselves. He doesn't say, this is what I mean by what I say. Rather, he writes Revelation, we read it, we interpret it. Now that's the way it is in our lesson for today. From Revelation 4, 1 through 6, 8 through 11. After this I looked, and there was a door that had been opened in heaven. The first voice that I heard, which sounded like a trumpet, said to me, Come up here, and I will show you what must, what must take place after this. At once I was in a spirit-inspired trance, and I saw a throne in heaven, and someone was seated on the throne. The one seated there looked like Jasper and Carnelian, and surrounding the throne was a rainbow that looked like an emerald. 24 thrones and 24 elders seated upon them surrounded the throne. The elders were dressed in white clothing and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came lightning, voices, and thunder. In front of the throne were seven flaming torches which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a glass sea, like crystal, was in front of the throne. In the center, by the throne, were four living creatures encircling the throne. These creatures were covered with eyes on the front and on the back. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, and each was covered all around and on the inside with eyes. They never rest day or night, but keep on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is coming. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne who lives forever and always, the 24 elders fall before the one seated on the throne. They worship the one who lives forever and always. They throw down their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things. It is by your will that they existed and were created. And the key verse is, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power 
because you created all things. It is by your will that they existed and were created. Symbolic language. I read three different commentaries on this passage and I got three very distinctly different interpretations because three scholars saw the meaning of this passage in three different ways. We know that Revelation was a pastoral letter written, in the first, written to first century Christians in what is now Turkey. These were difficult times. Wars were raging. Nero died in 68 AD. That area had three emperors in two years. They were experiencing famine and they were experiencing the consequences of earthquakes. There was a cloud of darkness over the land and in the hearts of people. Christians were subject to economic discrimination. Christians were being discriminated against. They could not get jobs. They could not be hired. They were being persecuted because they were Christian. Life was so tragic that John expected the end to come at any time and very soon. John thought that life was so horrible that surely the end of time was right around the corner. I can understand how he feel, felt, but now we know that he was wrong because the world existed a long time after John wrote Revelation. So John had a vision and he writes about it in very symbolic language. In chapter 4, 1, John was invited into heaven to see the future and to enter through an open door, meaning that heaven does not have closed doors, but heaven has open doors. In 4, 2, he saw God seated on a throne the throne was symbolic of authority and power. And he saw God as having authority and power. In 4.3, the throne was surrounded by a rainbow. The rainbow is a sign of God's covenant with Noah and God's people. Some of us were in the Holy Land together a few years ago. And you remember we were traveling across the Sea of Galilee and an incredibly beautiful rainbow came in the sky. And though it was, it was a double rainbow. Thank you, Cricket. We knew Cricket was here because she's correcting us already. <laughs> it was a double, it was a double rainbow and it was incredibly beautiful. The rainbow in biblical times was to remind the Hebrew people of God's covenant with them when God made a covenant with them by giving the Ten Commandments. And so John uh, sees a rainbow reminding him of God's covenant. In 4.4, 4, John sees 24 elders surrounding the throne representing the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 disciples. So he sees these 24 elders, 12 tribes of Israel, and the 12 disciples are all around God's throne. In 4 or 5, he sees seven flaming torches. <coughs> seven is a very popular number in Scripture. It represents completion. <clears throat> Whenever we use the number seven, we should be reminded that God is the one who does the completing. The baptismal font has seven sides around it to remind us that in baptism we are completed. So the number seven was important. And he saw an area like a sea, a smooth, clear, and beautiful sea. That's important. Because in biblical times, 
the shepherd could not take the sheep to water that was rolling. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down by still waters. Sheep would not go to waters that were bubbling up and rippling. And so he sees here in this vision a very calm sea surrounding the throne. And there were four creatures who were awake. They saw everything day and night. They observed life all the time. And the four creatures give glory and honor and thanks to God. In 4, 10 and 11, John had a vision of worship that was filled with movement. And even today, our worship services are filled with movement. You think about the worship service here, even this morning. There will be a processional. Someone will carry the processional cross. The candles will be lighted. One symbolizing the humanity of Christ, the other symbolizing the divinity, for Jesus was both human and divine at the same time. And so we light two candles to remind ourselves of that. There's the movement of the choir to their place. There's the movement of the people to the pews. There's a movement in the taking up of the offering. There's a movement of the liturgist. There's a movement to read the scripture. There's a movement to stand to reading the scripture. There's a movement uh, when we pass the peace to one another. Uh, there's a movement uh, toward the pulpit. Uh, the pulpit in our church, as you know, is symbolized like the bow of a ship, representing the need to carry the gospel all over the world. <coughs> so that even as John was seeing movement in heaven, he was also thinking about movement that comes when we worship God, and it does. So God is at work in creation, showing us signs of mercy and love. And we can be mindful of these symbols of God's presence. We can choose to respond with praise and thanksgiving. But our teaching does not stop there. Our teaching tells us that we are also to be living symbols of God's living presence. Our lives are to be symbolic of God's love. Our lives are to be symbolic of what love requires. Our lives are to be symbolic of the kind of compassion that Jesus had. But we're not, just skin, we're not just skin and bone. We're to live symbolic lives that interpret for others the meaning of love and the meaning of justice. And we're to interpret for others what it is that really gives life meaning. So thanks be to God for... John, who writes in symbolic language, though we disagree on how to interpret it, the message is clear, and we're grateful for it. Do we kick up any questions? Joe, well, what are the seven symbols that you mentioned? Uh, the number seven just represents completion. Uh, creation, seven days. <coughs> yeah. Creation was completed in seven days. Yeah. What does the animals mean with these multiple eyes? Well, there's a lot of discussion about that. About he's asking what does the animals mean with multiple eyes and wings? And biblical scholars disagree about what that means. I take it to mean observation. That God is always looking, has many eyes. There's no place where God is absent. You know, you said there were four, right? Four. 
Yes. Yes. I, that could be. That certainly could be. Yes. Yes, that, I think that's a good interpretation of that. Right. We think what Jack said. Oh, I'm sorry. Jack, Jack was saying the number four could represent north, south, east, and west. And, and I think that is a good interpretation of the number four. I just want to get one up on Chip. He's sitting back here instead of up there. Well, you could. Uh, <laughs> See, that's the difference between UT and MTSU. Yeah. He got the answer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. You know. yeah. Jack, you could write a poem about that. <laughs> Yes, right, right. And I, I, I think that means that there's no place where God is absent. God is far beyond us, deep within us, and all around us. We cannot go any place to escape God's mm -hmm. presence. It's always there. I do have a question. <clears throat> what happens to the consecrated white and bread after... The communion in the Methodist Church. How is it disposed? Because you it's hear the question. It's no. different in the Catholic Church. Yes, That's it just is. That's why I was wondering. Yes, she's asking what happens to the consecrated bread and wine in the uh, United Methodist Church. And I have to say that it's just disposed of in the uh, the Roman Catholic Church. It's interesting about Holy Communion. It's the one thing that should bind Christians together all over the world. But historically, Holy Communion has been one of the things that has divided the church. In the Roman Catholic Church, for example, our Roman Catholic friends believe in transubstantiation, which means that the bread literally becomes the body of Christ, not just symbolically, but literally. And so in the Roman Catholic Church, that bread and wine are handled very carefully, often taken to the sick, uh, often used at weddings and funerals and so forth because it's been consecrated. But in our tradition, it's symbolic. It's not literal. And so it's disposed of. Now, in some Methodist churches, um, the bread and the wine are taken on that very day to uh, the sick, to uh, prisons, to people outside the church. I know, I know of one Methodist church in Atlanta that um, has, they, they feed the homeless after the 11 o'clock service. And after communion is served, the pastors take the elements outside the church and they serve communion to all the people who are in line waiting to get in for lunch. Yeah. We need to be a lot more intentional about that. Yes. I don't know that much about it, but I do know that sometimes the bread is fed to voters. I, I'm, I can't hear you. The, the communion bread is sometimes fed to birds. Fed to birds, yes. It's not supposed to be thrown away. Yes, it's not supposed to be thrown away. It's supposed to be put to use. That's exactly right. I've seen uh, Catholic uh, priests or whoever they might be, if there's certain wine left over, they, they, they yeah. consume it. Well, sometimes it, it is, it is, the priest will consume. That's exactly right. Yes. I think you have to understand, though, when we say that, we kind of think, well, you know, the priest. This is literally to these people the blood of Jesus Christ. Whatever you have to do, if you drink it, if you, I used to take it to old people that couldn't come out, you know, couldn't come to mass. We have to understand, and I don't mean to be critical, but this is a very, very important thing that is done in the Catholic Church. And there is nothing about it no, that's right. Well, it's it's the belief in, in transubstantiation, and uh, 
I, I am um, I am one who feels like that Holy Communion should be served more often um, if we serve it only on the first Sunday and if you miss the first Sunday you're eight weeks without receiving the body and the blood uh, now I know in a large membership church like this that's very, very difficult to, to do in the sanctuary. But I found myself wondering if there might be another way in another place, maybe a little chapel right down here, to make the sacrament available every Sunday for people who feel a need to take it. Um, Amen. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, the pastor here, and so I can't. Yes, Winston? Joe, I just as a reminder, we you we at one time had the uh, elements available after every church service. Yeah, I don't know how long yeah. ago that was under whose watch, right. but we did that. Well, I it was Mark. Yeah, uh, that that was not when I was the pastor here, but but I've heard others say that mm -hmm. that after yeah right. Well, it's just um, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, when I, my father was Catholic. She's saying maybe you better stand so people can Catholics hear. Catholics have mass every day. Yeah. Right. And my father was Catholic, and uh, when I was a little girl, we'd ride down the road and we'd pass a Catholic church and we'd make the sign of the cross. Yeah. Right. And I asked him, "Why do you think you're trying?" Because Jesus is there. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah. She's my saying father, that when, when I, I, we were riding down the road in the car, we passed the Catholic Church. My father was Catholic. He would make the sign of the cross. Mm -hmm. And I was asking why he did that. And he said, because Jesus is there. Well, those are, those are, those are symbols that, that mean a lot. The Coptic Church has a beautiful symbol. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Coptic Christians keep a little bowl of water by their bedside. And when they get up in the morning, they take three fingers and put it in the bowl of water to remind them of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then they touch it to their forehead to remind themselves that they are to embody Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the same in the Roman Catholic Church. My grandparents and you know aunts and uncles, they had a holy water right by the door when yes. you left the house to go outside and you blessed yourself. Yes. And I think, you know, right now we're looking at it from a modern standpoint, but when these people came over, you know, they were, this was a long time. The church was everything to them. And Europe and, and you know, right. when they came here, that was their, you know, saving grace, their link to the past. And, that's right. I see I saw Ben back here. We've got Joe, we're talking about the, a lot about the Roman Catholic Church and the communion tradition. I've been to numerous ones and it seems to me that it depends upon the priest that's in charge. Um, we went to a funeral here in fact by his son and they even said the Lord's Prayer. He led the Lord's Prayer and he said it like we do in our church and we have the words and the hands. I remember going up afterwards and I said that Thank you for doing this. Is all I think we had some Protestants in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think at communion time also, uh, they, they, they know they, they if you if you believe that that is the body of Christ, then so be it. You can go up there and take it. If you don't, I've seen those that will invite come on anyway. I've seen parishioners drink the wine afterwards. I've seen priests drink the wine. So I can bury people there. Also, I think uh, we need to know that there are a lot of Protestant denominations that have closed mm -hmm. You have to be a member That's right. of that church. That's right. And they only have it at certain times when only members will be there. So, mm -hmm. like I said, there's a lot of provisions that have to take that. Well, for. Uh, I'm Jeff, sorry, one more time. That's okay, Jeff. This is jumping to another deal, but you're talking about symbols. In a good Jewish family, you will have what's called a mezuzah on your door 
when you walk in. Every time you walk in, you touch that settle prayer for him too. Right. So it's just another religious symbol. Well, I think I think what I what this lesson taught me was that that we need. I feel like we need to stress the symbols in our tradition a bit more and the symbols in our sanctuary and also the symbols of the bread and the wine and what that means when we do that. One of the things we have not stressed is the importance of repentance before we come to the table. Because we are to repent of our sin and then come and receive these signs of forgiveness. I feel like we could uh, we could stress that, and I'm not I'm talking about me that that I did not when I was a pastor, I did not stress the importance of forgiveness before coming, but I am pleased that in our tradition. The table is seen as the Lord's table, and all are invited to, per, to partake of these signs. Not every branch of Christendom agrees with us, but for us, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ are made available to all people who desire to partake. Thank you all for listening and participating. Amen. Amen. <laughs>